Um, please come with me to the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew. Chapter 13, uh, verse 44, one verse in your hearing this morning. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. And I'll be reading from the Amplified Version. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a very precious treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field, securing the treasure for himself. The kingdom of heaven is like a very precious treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field, securing the treasure for himself. Let the people of God say, amen. So we have been in a message series for the past three weeks entitled, The Kingdom of God is like the kingdom of God is like. And for uh, those of you who are just tuning in and you haven't been here for our series, please go to our YouTube. The previous three messages are there. Um, and so please go to our YouTube. Um, not right now, stay here, <laughs> enjoy the message right now, but please go back and watch those previous messages. But um, we have been in a message series entitled The Kingdom of God is Like. The whole purpose of this message series, we've been diving in and discovering what the kingdom of God is like, its essence, its elements, its characteristics. We've been diving in I'm um, learning about the kingdom of God in order to move and operate with a kingdom mindset in the earth realm. Amen. And so um, the great importance of what we're talking about, the kingdom of God, and the fact that we've been coming from um, the book of Matthew is that um, Matthew, the audience, the, the gospel of Matthew, excuse me, the audience of the gospel of Matthew is primarily the Jews. And then the theme of the gospel of Matthew is Jesus is king. So please type that in your comments, say Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And so while that theme is so important, um, not only to the gospel of Matthew, but especially to what we're talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is king. We have to understand what Jesus' priority was. What is the, what is the significance of him being the king? Um, back in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, what we have is what we see is this, this, this is the destruction of Jerusalem um, due to the Babylonians. I um, mean, this was due largely in part to Israel's idolatry due to their rebellion, due to their disobedience towards God. And so throughout there, um, throughout um, that tribulation where Jerusalem is destroyed, some, some of the Jews are exiled and some of them remain in Jerusalem. And so during this time of great despair and tragedy, the Jews are looking towards God. They're saying, God, where are you at? Look, I know even in their, even in their despair that was caused by their own disobedience, they're still looking, they're like, God, where's our redemption? Where is the redemption of Jerusalem? And God says, he assures them through the prophets, through the Old Testament prophets, that there is a king coming, that there is a Messiah that's coming to redeem the land, to redeem the nation of Israel. And so they hold on, they hold on to this hope that their king, the Messiah is going to come. And what we, what we see right before we get to the gospel of Matthew in those 400 years is the rise of the Roman empire and the oppression, how they oppressed the Jewish people. And so they're looking for a king to come and redeem them from Roman oppression. What they did not know was that the, when Jesus came, he was not coming uh, in his first coming to redeem them from Roman oppression, but he was coming to redeem them from spiritual oppression due to sin. See, they thought their biggest issue was we got to get up out of Roman oppression, but no, there was a greater oppression that they were suffering at the hands of, and that was due to their sin. In fact, that was the reason why they were led into exile. That's the reason why the Babylonians, God gave them over to the Babylonians, because of their idolatry, because of their rebellion. And so God said, no, I'm going to come and send Jesus in his first coming first to deal with your sin due to the oppression, due to your sin. And then in Jesus's second coming, that's when he's going to come onto the earth and set up his messianic kingdom. And so when we're talking about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, these are used interchangeably. So when I say kingdom of God, when I say kingdom of heaven, they're used interchangeably. They mean same thing. I'm going to go back and forth between the two. And so when we're talking about the kingdom of God and his authority and his rule, we have to understand that first is that there is no part of this earth of this universe that God does not a rule and have dominion. In Psalm 47, verse one through two, the psalmist says, oh, clap your hands, all you people shout unto God with the voice of triumph triumph for the Lord most high is to be feared. He is a great king over all the earth. He is a great king 
over all the earth. And in Psalm 103, verse 19, the Bible says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all the universe. So this universe came into being, the Bible says, by the word of this mouth, this world and this universe was created. So God has dominion over this world. But when we transition in talking about kingdoms, we have to distinguish um, between two, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, um, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. He says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. See, due to the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, there was imminent Enmity, uh, excuse me, um, hostility. I'm going to try to use the easier word. Hostility between God and man due to the sin that entered into the world through Adam. And so what happened was, was that we were born enemies of God. We were born children of wrath. And so through our salvation, through Jesus Christ, before, before we were saved, those of us believers, we were saved. We were under the domain of darkness. We were under the rule of our sins. We were slaved and slave to our sin. But when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior through his atoning sacrifice, he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, who is Jesus Christ and is whom we have redemption. And this is the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of heaven that we as citizens of Jesus Christ, this is the kingdom that we inhabit. This is the kingdom that we kingdom that we bring forth into the world. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, those of us who are believers. And so in order to operate with the kingdom mindset here on earth, in order to bring the kingdom, Jesus brought the kingdom. He initiated the kingdom. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's speaking, said, I'm here. So I've initiated the kingdom of God has come into the earth. And now the kingdom of God, it continues on through us, through believers. But we, the first thing we have to understand is that if we're going to rule and operate with the kingdom mindset, the king must rule in our hearts and minds. See, a lot of us, we want to walk around and try to walk around with God's authority. We want to try to walk around and do anything with God's authority. But how are we going to operate in his authority if he's not ruling in our hearts first? He has to rule. He has to set up. He has to be Lord. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. He's acknowledging his authority, acknowledging his deity. The king has to rule in here first if I'm going to exercise authority authority in the earth realm. I'm reminded of Acts chapter um, 19. There were some Jewish exorcists who saw the apostle Paul um, casting out spirits. And so they tried to do the same thing. They tried, they walk up to, uh, they walked to the people who possessed with evil spirits and they said, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Basically saying, I adjure you by Paul's Christ, by Paul's God to come out. And so the evil spirit answered them. They said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize. But who are y'all? I, I don't know who y'all are. Who, who do y'all think y'all talking to? I mean, I recognize who Jesus is. I recognize who the apostle Paul is. But I don't know who y'all are. And that's because witchcraft and idolatry were ruling in their hearts. You can't rule with the authority that God has given you if you got so many other things ruling in your heart. And that's why God calls us to die to ourselves because in in order for us to exercise that rule, he alone has to rule. Witchcraft, idolatry, sinfulness, lust, those things, I cannot be expected to rule as he has ordained me to rule if I got other things ruling in my heart and mind first. So the king must rule in me first so that I can exercise the authority that he has given me in the earth. Amen. And so when we come into the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a very precious treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field, securing the treasure for himself. We said that a parable is a story, a short story, a narrative that combines common imagery, common social context and pairs it with the spiritual truth. And the purpose of the parables was to really take um, the context of what the people were living at the time, using their social context and pairing it with the truth so they have something to relate to, so that truth can come out of something that was familiar to them. And so the parables that we've been going through through Matthew 13, they're speaking of the kingdom of God as it's operating right now between Jesus's first coming and um, before we get to a second coming. So it's speaking to now how he's ruling. And there's some other parables that speak later um, that refer to Jesus's messianic kingdom. And so at this point in verse 34, 
Jesus is only speaking to his disciples. A couple weeks back when Pastor Brandon first started, he, Jesus started off in um, Matthew 13. He started speaking to people from the Sea of Galilee. But at this point um, in Matthew 13, verse 36, um, he says, Jesus says, the Bible says that Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain clearly to us the parable of the weeds or the tares in the field. And so from 36 to 43 and now 44, this is how, this is where we are. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, you're probably asking, why is Jesus using hidden treasure as the context for this parable? Um, believe it or not, hidden treasure, hidden treasure, excuse me, was a common phenomenon in Israel at this time. Um, during wars, when they would come and loot and um, loot houses during wars, um, the people of those homes residing in, in those homes in Israel would hide their treasures buried beneath the ground so that during war, um, the people who are coming to steal from their houses wouldn't be able to steal from them. So they would bury their treasure underground. So this would be a familiar, familiar concept context to the disciples who were living at that time. And so this parable right here has five basic parts. I broke it down very easily. So the first part, we got treasure hidden in the field. Second part, a man finds the treasure. Third part, the man hides the treasure again. Number four, the man sells all that he has. And the last part, the man buys the field securing the treasure. Five easy parts. Now, this parable, it's easy to get caught up in a lot of the minor details that are not mentioned. We don't know who hid the treasure. We don't know what the treasure was, when it was hidden, why the treasure was hidden, how it was hidden. There's a lot of minor details that we don't know. I mean, the parable just says the kingdom of heaven is like a very precious treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. We don't know a lot of those minor logistics. And you know what? That's fine, because the focus of this parable is not so much the minor details concerning the treasure and how he found it, but what the man did once he found the treasure. <laughs> the minor details that are coming before that are not necessarily implied. We don't have to waste our energy and our brain energy trying to figure out how all of this happened. The focus of this parable is not so much how it came to be, but what the man did with the treasure once he found it. And see, here's another thing. When we're looking at this um, parable, we see that the Bible does declare that this was a treasure. But I will submit to you that equal perception of value is not always guaranteed among everybody. What am I saying? There's an old saying that says one man's trash is another man's treasure. What I'm saying is, is that not all treasures are perceived through the same lens in the same manner. And so while I'm not denying that this was not a treasure because that's what the Bible says, what I am submitting is that this man's ensuing action will demonstrate to us how valuable this treasure was to him. If we were to put two people in a room and there was a piece of treasure in the middle of it, one person can look at it and say, mm, I got to get my hands on that thing. That thing is priceless. But another person can look at that same treasure and look at it from a different perspective and say, mm, it's nice, but it doesn't mean all, it doesn't mean that much to me. You can have a treasure sitting in the middle, but it's up to the two different perspectives of the two people. They may have two different pr perspectives. And based Based upon how they perceive that value, how valuable that treasure to be, their actions are going to demonstrate how they feel about that treasure. And so that's why I want to point in my focus um, this morning. Three actions, three actions that demonstrate how valuable this treasure was to this man. First, he hides the treasure again. He hides the treasure again. Now, why do we hide valuable things? Think about your phone. Think about your iPad, cell phone, wallet, keys. Why do we hide those things or keep them in a, what my dad likes to say, uh, keep them in one central location? Why do we do those things? We, we do that, we hide them in one central location to prevent them from being stolen to prevent them from being exposed to external factors that can ruin the quality of them, to prevent uh, especially people as valuables. We hide people from being killed. I mean, I watch a lot of Law and Order, I'm sorry. <laughs> I watch a lot of Law and Order and Chicago PD. And so a lot of the times when they're trying to hide witnesses in a trial, what did they do? They put them in safe houses. They put them in witness protection. Why? Because the person is valuable to the testimony that's needed to convict the criminal. And so what did they do? They hide the person because the person is valuable to what they need. And so what is the overall reason? Protection. The man wouldn't have hidden the treasure again if he did not believe the treasure was valuable. 
the man would not have hid the treasure again if he did not believe, if he did not see that this treasure, if he did not believe within his own perception that this treasure was valuable. valuable. It's because he hid it that we know that he saw value in this treasure. Um, let's go to Hebrews 12, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 11, 23. By faith, Moses, after his birth, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful and divinely favored child and they were not afraid of the king's decree. By faith, Moses, after his birth, was what? Hidden for three months by his parents. Why? Because they saw that he was a beautiful and divinely favored child. If his parents thought that Moses was just a little ordinary baby with nothing special, especially at that time when Pharaoh issued a decree saying kill all the Hebrew boys, they would have just left poor Moses just out there, just exposed. But because they saw that he was divinely favored, they what? hid him to protect them, not out of fear, but because they saw how God had favored their child. So out of that perception of his value, they hid Moses. They hid him. I just want to take a pause right there. I'm so grateful that in seasons where God could have exposed me, come talk, talk back to me, in seasons where God could have exposed me for things that I didn't want anybody else to know about, he hid me. He protected me. There's some things that a lot of you don't want people to know about. You know what I'm saying? There were some seasons in your life where God shielded you, where he purified you with hyssop in secret. He, uh, he restored you in secret. He hid you from being exposed so that he could do the work in private. I'm so glad that he's not just a hiding place from protection from outside forces, but he's a protection. He's a hiding place for me to get myself together so that when he brings me out, he can bring me out as pure gold. And I can testify to what he did to me in secret. The man hid the treasure because he saw how valuable it was. He protected it and shielded it. This is how we also know that he saw that this treasure was valuable. He sells all that he has. He sells all that he has. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a very precious treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. First part, he sells all. He didn't sell a half of his stuff. A quarter, two thirds, he sold all of what he had. Yeah. Matthew 19, this is the account of the rich young, rich young ruler, excuse me. He comes and says, teacher, what good things shall I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus saying, um, you know, if you wish to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? You know what I'm saying? He says, well, you should not commit murder, adultery. You shall not steal. Honor your father and your mother. And the young man said to them, all these things I have kept. What else? And this is the killer. Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, complete. He said, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away grieving for he was once uh, for he was one who owned much property. Now, a lot of people take this as a universal call for all of us to give up all of our stuff. And that's not what this is conveying. The thing is, is that what I love about Jesus is that he's able to identify each one of our idols. This man's idol was his possessions. And so what Jesus is saying, he's not giving a universal call for all of us to necessarily give up all our possessions, but to give up our idols, to give up our idols and come follow him. Because like I said before, I can't submit uh, to a rule. I can't submit to the king and still have other idols ruling in my heart. So what he's saying to the man is give away all of that stuff because that's your idol. Give away all of it and come follow me. But here's the thing. Here's the difference between the Matthew 13 man and the Matthew 19 man, the rich young ruler. The one who found the treasure in the field, he was willing to sacrifice all that he had to obtain the treasure. The rich young ruler was unwilling to sacrifice all that he had for eternal life, something that he was asking for. So the thing that he was asking to obtain, to get from God, he was not willing to sacrifice all that he had to obtain the thing that he asked for. 
The man who found the treasure in the field, he sold, here it is, he sold all that he had in joy. He went back to his house after he found that treasure. He went back to his house. He gathered all up his stuff. He said, take it. <laughs> take it with a smile on his face. He said, take all this stuff. The Matthew 19 man, he went away grieving. So as opposed to joy in selling all that he had, the Matthew 19 man, after refusing to give up all this stuff, went away grieving. The man who found the treasure in the field, he valued the treasure he found and was seeking to obtain more than his possessions. The rich young ruler in Matthew 19 valued his possessions more than the treasure of eternal life. What am I trying to communicate? Based upon what you value and how much you value it, you'll be willing to give up some stuff. You'll be willing to give up all. You'll be willing to surrender all for what you value and for what you treasure. Come to me with, to Philippians 3. The Apostle Paul says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And this is what I really want to get to. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value. There it is. That's that word again. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may so that I may gain Christ. See, previously in this passage, um, Paul was talking about, you know, you know, I, as a as a believer, I shouldn't boast. But if I could boast. I would be right to do so. You know what I'm saying? I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was born in the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I was a zealous persecutor of the church. As to the law, as to the righteous, righteousness and the law, blameless. But for the sake of Christ, for the surpassing value of knowing Christ, he counted all of those things as loss. What you value and what you treasure, are you willing to throw away? Are you willing to surrender all for who and what you truly treasure? This is what the man in the field showed us, that he valued this treasure so much much that he sold all of his possessions. He sold all of it. He did not leave any of it back. He did not restrain any of them. He did not hide them somewhere. He sold all of what he had. And this is how we really know that he valued this treasure. He buys the field. He buys the field presumably using all the money that he acquired from selling all that he had. Now, in my study, I found some discrepancies concerning Jewish law and property. Some sources say that according to law, an individual had to purchase the field where the treasure was found in order to obtain the right to it. Some say that according to law, the treasure rightfully belonged to the person who found it. Some sources say that the individual who found the treasure was required to return the treasure to the master of the field only if he lifted the treasure out. I mean, it went in so many directions. So I decided to shy away from that <laughs> and get to the meat. It is unknown whether this field was legally, whether this field legally belonged to someone. I mean, it just says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. There's no implication of a master here. There's no implication. And while I'm, not, while I'm not saying that there wasn't, there is no implication. And what made it uh, what made this conclusion a little bit easier to lean into, not completely, but a little bit easier was the fact that he was the, the fact that he was able to buy it again, not suggesting that a master didn't already own it, but he bought it. I mean, he could have bought it from a master, you know what I'm saying? Or there's a possibility that the field didn't belong to anyone and it was up for grabs and he bought that field. What I really want to suggest to you is that possibly this treasure couldn't be lifted from the earth. I mean, if the treasure could be lifted out of the field, I mean, he could have easily just said, oh, <laughs> put in his pocket and went about his way. But he didn't do that. He bought the entire field that the treasure was in. What I would like to suggest is that if the treasure could not be lifted up out of the field, the man would have had to purchase the entire field in order to legally possess the treasure that was in the field. 
If the treasure possibly, I would suggest, I would suggest that the treasure could not be lifted up out of the field. Maybe it was a gold mine. Maybe it was a silver mine. Maybe it was so buried up beneath the earth that it, that he couldn't lift it up out of the field. And so in order to secure that treasure for himself, he had to purchase the entire field. And by purchasing, purchasing the entire field, not only does he have the field now, but he has what he really wants, which is the treasure that is in the field. The lengths, the lengths that this man went to secure the treasure for himself. He hid it, sold all that he had, and then purchased the field to secure the treasure for himself. These lengths show how much this man truly, truly, truly valued this treasure. Now, as we go into the explanation of this meaning, I really want to encourage you to not look at this parable from a dogmatic doctrinal perspective. If you go and study this parable, which I highly encourage you that you do, you will see that a lot of scholars and theologians, um, they converge at a central point of this parable, which is the value of the kingdom of heaven, but a lot of them diverge at different points as, as, it, as it pertains to the interpretation of the different elements. The reason why I'm encouraging you is not, why, excuse me, the reason why I'm not encouraging you to be dogmatic, to be doctrinal about the exact meaning of this parable is because you're gonna completely miss the point. Sometimes when we're studying scripture, there are issues, don't get me wrong, that need to have secure doctrine, but the parable in this context Context, I would argue doesn't need to be dogmatized and doctrinized to one meaning. The reality is, is that the beauty of this parable is the value of the kingdom. And others have seen how this is diverged in different ways. They have been consistent. But I would advise you to not be so strict to one meaning. I'm going to present to you my conclusion. And I'm going to try and tie, tie in some of those other conclusions because I was able to see how they all connected together. And some of those I'll dive into depth on two. Tuesday. But here's how I concluded this. In Matthew 13, 36, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, um, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 36, he's talking to his disciples. And so in that, when he's explaining the different elements of that parable, he defines the field as the world. And because this parable of the hidden treasure immediately follows, immediately follows that parable, I would suggest and I would come to the conclusion that the field represents the world. And so if the field is the world in this parable, based on the actions of the man in the parable, I, it can be strongly concluded, and I got some people to back me up on this, it can be strongly concluded that Jesus is the man who found the treasure. And the treasure, which is likened to the kingdom of heaven, represents the sons and daughters of the kingdom of heaven. Follow me. The man found the treasure in the field, in the world. God sent Jesus into the world. So when Jesus did all that he did, he didn't do it up from heaven. He added humanity to his deity, came, was born of a virgin, came and entered into the world. See, in order for the man to find the treasure, he had to be in the field. Jesus came into the world. He came into the world, added humanity to his deity, and he is in the world. The man sold all. He gave up all. He sacrificed all he had with joy. Similarly, Jesus gave up all, sacrificed all, gave his all, endured the pain and the suffering of the cross, despised the shame of hanging on the cross the for the humiliation that came with the cross, for the joy set before him. That's what Hebrew says, is that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. So just how this man sold all that he had in likewise manner, Jesus sacrificed all that he had, gave his life. It's not even that Jesus gave his possessions, but he gave a prized possession, his own life, gave his own life. Here we go. The man, and see here, the man purchased the field using the money he earned from selling all his possessions, securing the treasure as his own. Two things I want to show you here. Jesus reconciled the world 
the field, reconciled the world to God the Father by abolishing the hostility between God and humanity. Come with me to 2 Corinthians um, 5. Give me a second. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, new, excuse me, new creation or new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us, who brought about peace, who, who united us, who abolished the hostility and created peace between God and the Father, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of, of the word of reconciliation. Like I said, when sin entered into the world through the fall, there was enmity. There was hostility created between God and humanity. And so what Jesus did through his sacrifice, he reconciled us. He brought peace back between God and humanity, between God and man. And not only that, but for those of us as believers, he redeemed us. He redeemed us from the slavery and the penalty of sin. Come with me to 1 Peter 1. For you know that you were not redeemed from your useless way of life inherited from your forefathers with perishable things like silver and gold. See, I'm sure that the man who found the treasure redeemed the land using the money that he got from all that he sold. This was perishable money. But Peter says you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but you were actually purchased with the precious blood, that of a sacrificial lamb with unblemished and spotless, the priceless blood of Christ. So God, Jesus, the blood was the payment. So the man who bought the treasure, he bought the field using money. Jesus redeemed us. He reconciled us to the father with his blood. The blood was the payment. The blood was the Benjamin. The blood was Abraham Lincoln. The blood was the green dollar. The blood was the the 10, 15, 20, $100 bill. The blood was the payment that not only reconciled us back to the Father, establishing peace between God and humanity, but it was the blood that redeemed us from the slavery, from the slavery of, uh, excuse me, the slavery of sin and the rebelliousness that we caused. And in doing so, he secured us, just how the man bought the field and secured the treasure for himself. Through Christ's sacrifice, through his blood, he secured us. See, that's why no other the faith is secure. That's why Islam is not secure. That's why Hinduism is not secure. That's why Buddhism is not secure. Because you will not find any in any of those religions any mention of a sacrifice that involved blood. But I would venture to show you, I would venture to preach to you that it wasn't just the fact that he shed his blood, but this was uncontaminated blood. This was perfect blood. This was pure blood. Because he was not born as man was, but the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary and he came in this world. So everything that he shed, those pints of blood that rushed out of his body on that cross. That was pure blood. That was perfect payment. That was the payment that reconciled us back to the Father. That was the payment that redeemed us from the slavery of sin. And I can't say that about any other God. I can't say that about any other God. I don't know if you can say that about your God. I don't know if you can say that your God went up on a cross and was tortured and beaten beyond recognition. I don't know if you can say about your God that he was nailed in between his, in between his wrists. I don't know if your God can say that he took up a cross upon himself and walked and was tortured and was beaten was beaten and then beaten some more. I don't know if your God can say that. The reality of the situation is, is that the reason why we serve Jesus Christ, the reason why we serve the Son of God is because he didn't ask us. He's not asking us to do anything that he did not do before. He came into the world. He lived the life. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was bruised. He was tempted at all points, yet found without, without sin. And he died. So the very fact that he's asking us to die to him shouldn't be a big deal to us because he went on the cross and took the most most painful, most excruciating pain there was. Your God is asking you to do things that they haven't done. Your God is asking you to do things that are simple. Your God is asking you to do is conform to rituals. But Jesus is asking you to die. He's asking you to die. But he died himself to give you that example. Can you say that about your God? Can you say that about your statues? Can you say that about your universe? Can you say that about your stars in the sky? The one who created... 
the one who created the stars in the sky. Just like Romans, we always find a way to worship the creation, but not the creator. We always find a way to get around the bu- to get around the bush because we don't want to acknowledge who's running the show. We don't want to acknowledge who's the king. Stop running around the situation. Stop trying to find ways to worship creation. How are you worshiping the universe? How are you giving glory to the universe? How are you saying, universe, we thank you? How are you saying, universe, we thank you for these blessings? How are you saying, universe, thank you for keeping me at night? How are you saying, universe, thank you for preserving me at night? How are you saying, universe, thank you for preserving me through the pandemic? How are you saying, universe, thank you for preserving me through racial injustice? Universe, how are you saying, thank you for preserving me? How are we giving glory to an entity that was created instead of giving glory to the creator? I baffle at these, uh, I baffle at these atheists who believe that God is a figment of the their imagination. The reality was before all of this, we were a figment of imagination. There would be no humanity without God. He didn't need us, but he decided to create us. At one point, we was a figment of imagination. At one point, we didn't even exist. So how dare we? How dare we talk to God? How dare we say God is a figment of imagination? If it wasn't in him, we wouldn't even have an imagination to begin with. How dare we do that? He redeemed us. Redeemed us with perfect shed blood. That's what distinguishes him from all others. What I really want to drive home to you this evening is how Jesus sees you. If that wasn't already clear enough. First Peter two. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Don't you see? God sees you as the treasure. Yes, Jesus is a treasure, don't get me wrong. But you can't fully receive this truth and truly even receive the magnitude of his sacrifice if you do not receive how valuable you were to him. How valuable were you to him? That he left a heavenly abode where angels were glorifying and worshiping him. He left, came, was born into a world of sin, not sinful himself, but was born into a world of sin, tempted at all points, yet found without sin, was beaten and tortured, crucified, died, because you were and are a treasure to him. It says in Romans that one would, one would hardly die for a righteous man, even though in some cases that is, but he said, He laid his life down for his friends. He laid his life down for his friends. Peter reminds us with language from the Old Testament. You see that in this verse, I don't know what Bible you're using, but um, a lot of these phrases, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, a lot of these are in, uh, could be in capital, capital letters because these are references to the Old Testament, the same language that the Old Testament prophets would use to describe the nation of Israel. But under the new covenant, Israel is not just the Jews. Under the new covenant, Israel, God's people, is all those who come into a saving knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. So that's why Peter was able to say to those believers of various regions, whether they were Jew or Gentile, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is invaluable. You cannot put a price on it. And while others have diverged from this value of the kingdom of heaven and compared the treasure to the gospel and eternal life and what man should do in order to secure that, I agree with that. But the Bible also says to be imitators of Christ. And so anything that we are challenged to do, the call to sacrifice was first demonstrated through Christ. It was first demonstrated through him. And so our challenge to sacrifice, our challenge to die, our challenge to pick up our cross and follow him, it was first demonstrated through Christ. 
And that's why I wanted to present this verse, because it's through Christ that we have a model and a representation for all that we do. It's through Christ's love and a sacrifice that we have a model, that we have a plan, that we have a focus to die, to sacrifice. It's through Christ because he demonstrated it first. The value of the kingdom of heaven, the value of the, value of the kingdom of God is not just that it is the kingdom of God. I mean, that's, I mean that's, a, that's, that's probably at the forefront because this is God's kingdom, a holy, righteous, the God of the universe. This is his kingdom. But it came for us to enter and be citizens of a holy God's kingdom. It came at a tremendous price, a price that we would have never been able to pay. And so as we operate, as we seek to operate and bring the kingdom, remember that it came at a price. Remember that your citizenship that is in heaven as a believer, it came at a price. That your ability to exercise the authority that God has given you in his kingdom came at a price. We don't deserve to be called citizens of the kingdom of the God of the universe. We don't deserve to inherit the inheritance that we are to be inherited from a holy God and the God of the universe. But because Jesus gave all, because he saw you and me as a treasure to be inherited, he gave his all at the cost of his blood destroyed the hostility between God and humanity and redeemed us so that we could be, he like I said in Colossians, he transferred us from the domain of darkness where we once were into the kingdom of his beloved son. And now we can stand here boldly. I'm not saying walk around, woe is me, I don't deserve. I'm saying keep that in mind. The next time you want to walk around with big headedness and, and cockiness. Yeah, yeah, I'm God. You know what I'm saying? God doing all this through, through, the, through this through me. Remind yourself, recall to mind that what he is enabling you and empowering you to do came at a price. But be secure so that you can stand boldly and firm and say, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. I know what he did and I reverence it. And because of it, I submit to the rulership and to the lordship of the king. I don't do my own thing. I submit to his authority. I submit to his obedience. It's one of the foundations of being a kingdom citizen. Can't be walking around here claiming to be kingdom citizens and we doing whatever we want to do. It's not the point. What's the purpose of being a part of God's kingdom if we're doing, all, doing our own thing? If we're not being obedient, if we're not being submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, what's the point? No, no, no. To be in this kingdom, understand the price that was paid for you to even have entrance into the kingdom. And out of that reverence and out of that respect, obey. Out of that respect, out of that reverence, submit to his lordship. Out of that respect, reverence him for who he is. Acknowledge him as Lord. Acknowledge him as Lord. Let him rule. Be subject. Let him rule in your heart and mind. Amen. Amen. If you're on this live this morning and I want to take a time just to briefly speak to those of you. Um, the enemy wants your eyes to be blinded to how precious you are to Jesus. But this Jesus got on a cross and endured what we, I would argue to say, could have never been able to do because he saw you as a treasure. He snatched you out from the domain of darkness and transferred you to the kingdom so that you could be securely his, so that you can be secure in him. <laughs> could it be that your insecurity is because you're not secure in him? 
could it be that those issues that you struggle with, and I'm not saying that once you come over into salvation, you still don't struggle with insecurity. But what I'm saying is that could it be that the root of that insecurity is that you don't know whether or not you're truly secure in Christ? The greatest security you need to be concerned about in these days is the fact that if you were to take your last breath, you would be with our Lord and Savior. You would be in his presence immediately. That is the greatest security you can leave your family. That is the greatest security you can leave your friends. That is the greatest security you can leave anybody on this life that you claim that you love. That if anything were to happen to you, you know and they know where you're going and where you're going to be. And so if there's anybody on this live tonight, you don't have that, <laughs> tonight, excuse me, this morning, you don't have that security. You don't have that solid foundation in Christ and you want to. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I'm in need of you. I recognize that you are the God of the universe. I recognize that your son came to the earth to die for my sins. I recognize and I believe and I confess that he is Lord. And I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead and that he is seated at the right, at your right hand. Lord, please come into my life. Save me, redeem me. I don't want to be in the domain of darkness anymore. I want to come into your marvelous light. Lord, please save me right now. And I believe by your word that if I believe, if, if I confess with my mouth that, that you are Lord, that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, I believe that I am saved and that you have transferred me from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of your son. I believe that today in Jesus name. Amen. If that was you, please let us know. Type in the comments, send us a DM on Instagram. We want to connect with you. Salvation is just the first step. This whole life that we live as believers is called discipleship. We want to come alongside you and teach you and show you how to live this godly life that God has called you to live. If you're watching this live and you're saying, Pastor Dom, I am a believer, but I strayed away and I don't know how to get back. And I want to rededicate my life to the Lord. I can venture to say that a lot of times when we stray away, it's often, not always, but often because we didn't make Jesus Lord. We accepted that he saved us, but we truly did not make him Lord of our lives. In this moment, you can say, Lord Jesus, you rule, you reign, heart and mind. If that's you, I want you to type in the comments as well. That's me. I want to rededicate my life. If you've been watching us, how many years are we going on? Four. Four. <laughs> You watch, you've been watching this however long. It could have been all four years, three years, two, or you've recently just started watching this and you've seen us. And you are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is your Lord. But you don't have a home, a church home, a partner, and to serve. And you've seen us and you want to be involved. Listen, we got the welcome room coming in August, but if that's you, put it down in the comments. Our team is in there. We're waiting. We're listening. We're watching to see. We want to partner with you. We want to tell you all about what God is doing for our church. If that was any of you, if, if those calls apply to any of you, please let us know. And for that person who did accept the call, I'm just believing possibly that somebody did and that maybe they didn't acknowledge it. I believe that God, I believe that you are now in the family of God, that if you prayed that prayer of salvation, you are now in the family and now you are a citizen. God has transferred you from the domain of darkness into his marvelous light. And you are now a citizen of the kingdom. And it is now your responsibility as well as ours to carry the kingdom into the world and to show people that Jesus is king and that he rules and reigns above all. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate our king.